Presenting. Channeling Eric's Hour of Enlightenment. We have a special guest, Tom Cronin. Uh, you know, I'm, as you probably have noticed, I have been blasting his documentary everywhere, called The Portal. And uh, without further ado, I want to say also that we have the lovely Michelle Gray at thehealingh-arts.com. And we have my lovely boy, Eric. Hi, sweetie. Hi, Mama. He's happy to be here. He's excited. He said it's going to be a great show. Awesome. All right, so I, I want to tell you guys about this. I've, I've watched the trailer. The trailer alone blew me away. It's just amazing. I'm going to sink my teeth into it tomorrow, uh, so I can't wait. Anyway, so apparently this, the portal, this is an exper- uh, experiential documentary created as a part of a bold global vision, hence he's a light worker, to overcome chronic levels of anxiety depression, PTSD, and, and trauma that so many of us are facing today. And a lot of people who are in my group have suffered a lot of trauma and a lot of loss. So I, I think this yeah. is super important for for the Channeling Eric and the Atlanta Scaler peeps. So, you know, it, it speaks to this. This is There's a need for this right now. It couldn't happen at a better time. So anyway... It, well, you know, Tom, you can also say this, but we're, we're talking about six different people who were able to overcome great adversity using stillful, uh, stillness and mindfulness. Not my best feature, but I'm going to work on it. So, Tom, the mic is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, and it's um, great to be here. And I, when I saw the um, invitation to be on the Hour of Enlightenment radio show, I jumped at the chance because uh, one thing that I realized that inspired me with the film and the work that I do was that as I dived deeper into this exploration into enlightenment, the idea of what this is and the, the experience of what this is, uh, I started to realize that most of the world's, if not all of the world's suffering is that disconnect from our inner state of enlightenment that we all have within us and that if I could at least do something to support and guide people as to how we start that process of awakening or Mm -hmm. becoming more enlightened or connecting to what is already within us then we'll start to see uh, hopefully um, the reduction of uh, you know these are called samskaras these attachments and binding effects of the previous experiences of life trauma PTSD anxiety, Mm -hmm. um, shame, guilt, all of these things that, you know, cause us to act in a way that isn't necessarily going to be supportive of, um, you know, the people around us and ourselves. So um, really that was what inspired me to make the film was to start to hopefully give people access to that. And I saw in in the trailer, it really just seemed, it it really caught me when the woman said Mm -hmm. so many people or most people don't even know they have an inner space. That's yeah. amazing. How can you live life yeah. like that, Tom? Huh? Well, I guess that's where, you know, I was, you know, and, 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 you know, we get very easily distracted by the excitement of the outside world, you know, the, the thing calling our attention and the mind's looking to externally find some form of gratification. And, and so that inner world is very subtle and it's not something that we're naturally inclined to explore, even as a young child, you know. It's been said that, you know, a child up to the age of five will know what the McDonald's arches are before they know what their surname is. So it's just because there's so much enticing us in the outer world. Mm. And that's what causes that disconnect. And that inner world is something we tend to look towards after we've researched fulfillment in as many places as possible in the outside world. And we can't seem to find it. I did everything I was supposed to do. I got the, the kids and the marriage and the money and the the, the university degree and why am I still so unhappy and that's when we start mm. to make that inward journey normally. Yeah. Well, when did that yeah, all happen? That's exactly. I mean, when did this start happening? Was it centuries ago? Um, when did we start breaking up with our inner space and, and not even having any kind of relationship with it? Well, it's always been happening. What's, what's only recently been happening um, is the the inward journey so predominantly that 
that process of discovering something within us, that um, unboundedness, that blissfulness, that quietness within us, as was usually a domain of, of very monastic type existences, you know, monks and ashrams and monasteries. Mm. Um, so we've always been pulled into the outside world, looking for outer pleasures and outer desires. It's the nature of the ego. Um, this this process of it becoming an awakening experience and starting to explore the inner world is actually very excitedly starting to happen in a bigger way across the planet now. And this is the big shift that we're going through. You know, we've got 100 million people using meditation apps at the moment. So we're what? seeing a phenom mm. phenomenal movement towards meditation and towards bringing these very renunciant sort of practices into the mainstream now. So it's, it's actually a bigger shift now towards the inner world than we've ever seen. Is, does that have anything to do with us starting the the age of Aquarius, or is that just a a, a fictional boundary of, of sorts? Yeah, I don't. I'm not completely informed about the age of Aquarius, but I do know that there's a natural progression as we exhaust external sources of fulfillment, and we try to extract as much as we possibly can out of the outside world. And when we we've exhausted that, then we do something next after that usually is we start looking for another source of fulfillment and that's when we go inward. So I think what we're seeing is the level of affluence across the world. If you look back over 40,000 years of human existence or 200,000 years of human existence, if you want to go that far back, we've never been as affluent as we've ever been today, but we've never had as many depressed people and anxious people as we have today, you know, the levels of medicated yeah. people. Um, trying to overcome these yeah. things. And so we're getting to that sort of tipping point, that breaking point, which we talk a lot about in Good. the film. Uh, and that's that sort of on that, right at that sort of nexus, that sort of junction point where we either break down or break through now. You know, it's interesting you should talk about this because as a doctor, even as, as a young doctor, I thought it was very strange. You know, I, I bought my parents' practice out and they had a lot of patients of different age groups, and I was always struck by how unhappy the more affluent patients were and, and how how the, those with a simpler life seemed to be just content and were able to reach some sort of level of joy. And then my, um, my youngest daughter, uh, she's a resident in neurology right now, she went to Peru and she also was very struck by how these people, she was working in a clinic there, volunteering, how these, these people could be so happy and have nothing, not even shoes. And yet, you know, they, they were able to have happiness. So can you talk about that? Yeah, there's a beautiful um, word in Sanskrit called tapas. Uh, it's actually spelled T-A-P-A-S-Y-A. -A -A. And it's, it's the process of surrendering preferences and pleasures for a deeper, more fulfilling experience. So in you know, Catholicism, I grew up Catholic, so we have Lent and there's Yom Kippur, there's Ramadan, and there's mm -hmm. spiritual mm -hmm. traditions, which is meditation and sort of certain austerities where they'll give up preferences, you know, giving up their hair or putting on robes and giving up their wardrobe or giving away their money. And what we find in traditions, in um, spiritual practices, in cultures and in religions, where there's a, a willingness to forego pleasures to have a deeper, more richer experience in life beyond that sort of desire, there's a deeper levels of fulfillment in those cultures and traditions. But when we look at cultures and societies where there's just no willingness to give up pleasures and there's actually just continually trying to extract pleasure as mm. much as possible from our phones and our malls and our you know, garages that we have all that expensive cars in, what we find is um, greater levels of unhappiness. And that's because of the illusion that those things will bring happiness and the unfulfillment that comes when we acquire those things and we still can't find happiness. And so we kind of almost unfortunately have to go through an exhaustion point. It doesn't have to be that way, but it seems that it's turning out that way. But there are traditions that have a certain, you know, for me, this is very much the case. When I started to practice some form of tapas, that is to give up some form of my day to having a more fulfilling experience. So meditation, breath work, yoga, um, you know, journaling, uh, even things like sauna and foregoing food. So fasting, yeah. all these sorts of things are about mm -hmm. nourishing ourselves at a deeper level than nourishing ourselves from getting more likes on Instagram. Oh, wow. What? Oh, gosh. What you just yeah. that sentence is very powerful. 
you know, and to me, I, um, I've been through a whole lot of tragedy and loss and, you know, I'm wondering if that's what it takes sometimes, but, you know, t- to me, my idea of a beautiful life is to just have a little bit of land near a lake, have a little log cabin and, you know, with my family and just fish for our food and gather berries. I know it sounds stupid. I know, but I, you know, I ask myself, what do I want? I want nothing. And my husband says, what do you want for Christmas? Whatever. I, I actually, there's nothing I want. And, you know, I went through a little grieving period because when I first became a doctor, I started making good money and, oh, I'm going to get a Rolex. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, I can't wait until it, the new car comes in. And now I don't have that thrill anymore. I, I don't want anything. And it's like, you know, so I, I, so I don't get that rush. And I don't need it, I guess. But I grieved over the loss of that little rush that I had when I was stupid and young. Um, but do people need to, like, totally hit rock bottom? Um, no, not at all. And it's a good question. And firstly, I want to just make some clarity around what I was saying, because a lot of people are probably going to think, okay, I'm just going to give everything away and be fulfilled. It's not actually the case. We have mm-hmm. to find fulfillment mm-hmm. first. We have to connect to the inner bliss and the inner lovingness. And that's what the sadhana, the practice, the meditation is. There is an ocean of bliss within us. There's an ocean of lovingness within us. And it doesn't mean your outside world is going to be perfect. But if we, there's the difference between someone having nothing and still being miserable and the difference between willingly giving up things because they've already satisfied, satiated oh. their desires through an inner, inner connection. And some will call it source, some will call it God, some will call it divinity, some will call it their higher self, some will call it their heart. But what happens is there's a deeper, richer experience. It's got to be experiential. This is the important thing. It's not just about just throwing everything out the window today and finding somehow enlightenment or bliss. It doesn't actually work that way. We do have to have certain practices that are going to help mm-hmm. facilitate that connection. It's the disconnect that's causing the suffering. And we mm-hmm. have to make that connection back into um, that higher self or source or God or divinity, whatever you want to call it. Well, you know, I, I keep telling people, my Atlantic Gator peeps and my CE peeps, I, I love them so much. And I, I keep uh, trying to, through Eric, teach them that they are whole and part of God. They are divine mm. and vastly so. And in fact, each of us are love, the energy of love. We are love. And so how can you not love yourself how can you you not seek uh, feel that inner bliss when you are actually whole and part of god and you are the energy known as love the most powerful transmuter of realities ever i think that it's a beautiful question and the the response that comes through me when you you say those things is to go to a in the bible which is be still and know that i am god so the, the the reason that there is an omnipresence omnipresence means it can't exclude you so the omnipresence of divinity or god or source um mm. or, or or love can't exclude you in einstein called it the unified field so there's this recognition yeah. on a scientific level and on a spiritual level that there's an interconnected woven web of things of, of one one entity universe and the reason why we can't experience that and why we get distracted from that is because of the, the the pull externally to explore it in our Instagram or our Bitcoin or our superannuation or in our relationships or our Netflix and Spotify. So we mm. do need to withdraw from the senses. We need to, if you look at nearly all of the traditions that have that sense of connectivity to that, there's a degree of, of withdrawal. And we don't have to run away to a, a monastery for that. You know, it's simply... For me, you know, close my eyes for 20 minutes, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. It could be five minutes just to pause from being stimulated with your mind and with your senses, with your emotions, and to be excited, to quieten the mind, to quieten your nervous system, to quieten your physiology, and to connect into that stillness beyond the thinking mind and beyond your emotional body. And what you'll find there is an ocean of, of, of beauty in the silence and stillness. Oh wow! You you have a way with words. I mean, it's just, <laughs> <pretty does>. <laughs> it's just it's just incredible. Well, you know, you and I are meant to cross paths because I wrote this book that I learned from my own mistakes parenting, called um, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, what is it? 
raising children who think for themselves is based on the deal that we as humans are kind of pack animals, right? We need to find a, a, a way to belong, but there are two ways to do that. We can, we can just, you know, conform with society, go by their rules. And that means following an external compass to guide your choices, right? Or you can actually, um, gain this sense of belonging by earning it, by contributing something valuable to the pack so that then you are free to follow your internal compass. And those are people who do the right thing when no one is looking. Okay. That, 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 so, you know, it's self-directed versus externally directed. And I think externally direct, uh, external direction is the way to misery really. And self-direction, I think this is what you're hitting a nerve on is what can lead you to your inner bliss. And, and the way we parent, it's, there are very subtle things we say in my second uh, other book was hearing is believing how words can make a break our kids. But anyway, I don't want this to be about me, but uh, you know, the little things we say, even like, I'm so proud of you that tells a child, okay, then I'm going to look for cues for my mom, my dad to make sure that I keep making them proud. So it starts really early in the way we raise our children, the words we say and, and stuff, whether they are on a route from to misery or whether they're on the route to to finding the inner bliss, Tom, that you speak so much of. So we talk a lot about that in the film. That's why we chose six stories. Um, we wanted to bring in six, and we studied and researched about 300 different stories, and we ended up... Um, pulling out these six that we really felt fitted well into the film because they're very diverse yeah. stories and very diverse backgrounds. But mm -hmm. what we found is that there's a deep code that comes into the lives of these people, that it's the way they're programmed, the condition, the life experience that they have in the early years of their childhood to really set them up on a particular orbit or trajectory of life. Mm -hmm. And what that tends to do is that it, that, that means that we're, we're owned and influenced by something that wasn't necessarily in our choosing. It might be an abusive father or it might be a, a very rough childhood without any parents. Yeah. Or, um, and mm. so that, that trajectory that we go on um, isn't necessarily ours. How do we free ourselves from that? How do we create our own trajectory and how do we create our own path? And this is the thing that we sort of talk a lot about is that we have to liberate ourselves from that code and condition. And meditation plays a big part in that. Um, prayer and all sorts of other tools that we can use to help start to realize that each moment, each day, that I am being operated by a particular code, a software in my in my uh, break, in my makeup. But is that really serving me at a higher purpose? Is that code really of of use to me? And so starting to really get internal and introspective about what what our operating system is and see if that's the right operating system. And if not, then maybe we have to go about doing something to free ourselves of that and start to create our own. Well, Tom, how, why is it that some people have crap for childhoods and they end up being just fine and some maybe even less so and, and, and they end up being miserable? It's, it's, it's going to sound quite uncomfortable for some people possibly, but it is going to come down ultimately um, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, it's going to come down to choices. And some people want to wow. heal and grow. And some yeah. people, I know mm -hmm. people very close, that uh, they, they, they've got no interest in moving beyond their trauma and their pain and their suffering. And mm -hmm. some people go, I'm done with that. I'm, I'm ready to move forward. I'm ready to release myself from the bondage and the trapping of that scar tissue of the past. And I'm yeah. ready to create my own paradigm now and not be think, owned by those circumstances do you think ego has a lot that you know uh, just leading your life through ego uh, have a, a, something to do with that uh, too unless we're fully aligned we're all living our life through ego myself included <laughs> the ego is our yeah. thinking mind and feeling body our emotional body so it's um our ego is is very much the 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 driver in the machine until we we transcend or liberate or learn to coexist with that ego in a much more um, functional way. Well, you know, I, I really feel like this, and I can't wait to watch it beyond the trailer, that this documentary is something that is pivotal for humanity. 
I, I feel like you have touched upon something that could be the key to people finding their way out of misery and finding their way to joy. But, you know, and, and it looks, sounds like you're going to give some practical um, instructions to do that. Is, is there any practical stuff that you can share? Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, in the film, there's no practical tips. It's more just storytelling to showcase through the stories the, the power of meditation to mm. transform us. But um, And also looks at a sort of macro. We, you know, we talk on macro themes as well with three futurists to look at humanity and the planet as a whole, where we've been, where we're going. But mm. definitely for our listeners today, um, you know, the most important thing we can do on a daily basis is to withdraw from our phones and our TVs and our music and our family and our shopping and everything and just put aside some time each day into a form of meditation and find a particular style that works for you. Uh, you can, if you can't find any out there, there's tons of them on Instagram, uh, sorry, on uh, YouTube and there's lots of apps out there. I think there's 2,000 meditation apps out there. We've got a meditation program, which is uh, a unique meditation program that take, takes people a lot deeper that's the one that I've been using myself for about 26 years. So that ability, that's what we call it, the portal, to transcend the thinking mind and feeling body uh, is really to be, is the gateway to that, that ocean of inner joy and inner bliss. And so um, mm-hmm. trying to find at least some window of time, that tapas beside a preference allocated to inner being and inner bliss rather than outer bliss and outer happiness is really, yeah. um, I think, an important part of the day. Eric, I do want you to chime in um, in, in just a little bit because, uh, you know, from the spirit uh, spirit, spirit perspective, I'd like to, because mm-hmm. you're looking down at us peons and saying, okay, you guys are finally getting it, aren't you? But, um, you know, I, I just was thinking about my transition from a very difficult childhood, broken bones kind of abuse, right? And the way I was, of course, you know, I spent a lot of my youth and my young adulthood, oh, poor me, my parents are so bad, blah, blah, blah. But then I did, I said, I'm just a pawn now on a chessboard. I want to be the chess player, okay? I want to move these little pieces around in my direction that I want. And so I, I learned that, um, I learned how to do a lot of self-reflection and figure out, um, you know, what did I get out of it? And there's always something you get out of this. I mean, you always can get, there's always a teachable moment in every type of suffering. And once you can figure that out, you know, I I learned how to be uh, more nurturing. I learned how to be assertive. I learned how to be a better mother. And and so I I said, thank you, mom. Thank you, dad. I'm grateful for that. Assholes. No, I'm kidding. No, uh, and I, I was able to surrender and let it go. So so I think a, a lot of meditation that you're talking about also must involve some self-reflection. For example, okay, I want a new car. Okay, how long, you got a car, you know, five years ago. How long did that bliss last? You know, do you really want this? Uh, you know, how, how much happiness is it going to bring you? Is it going to be lasting? Uh, you know, what did I learn from this suffering, from that suffering? So I, I think internal reflection is, is kind of crucial, right? Yeah, absolutely. I call it critical thinking. And that's oh. to really put aside time to be critical with our thinking, to really do deep introspection. Look at how is my mind operating? What are the t- thoughts that I have on a daily basis? Why do I have those thoughts? What thoughts can I have if I don't have those thoughts? So remembering that for every thought that we have, Ooh. we have about yeah. forty to 50,000 a day. And 85% of the thoughts that we have each day are repetitive thoughts from the day before and the day before and the day before, like, you know, who's doing the grocery shopping today? I've got to unpack the dishwasher. So you think about it, most of them are fairly repetitive average sorts of thoughts. Um, and then 80% of the thoughts that we have, they're not even our thoughts. So if someone's listening to me, they're listening to my thoughts, not their thoughts. If someone's reading an Instagram oh. post, they're, they're reading someone else's thoughts, not their thoughts. If they're listening oh. to, you know, a TV show. So um, if you think about the actual time we have set aside for deep critical thinking, introspective perspective um, thinking, which is really getting deep into why am I thinking this way? And for every thought that we're having, there's 
an infinite number of thoughts that we're not having. So did I have a thought today um, visualizing my best-selling book and a book signing in Broadway, New York at a bookstore there, if there is a bookstore on Broadway, New York? Um, or did I have a thought today about me speaking on stage at a TED talk? Uh, well, if we didn't entertain those thoughts, which is fine if we didn't, then we, you know, what are the other thoughts that we could have had that we haven't had? Um, and that's when we start to really open up to amazing possibilities because there's a beautiful saying, yad babam tat bhavati, which means what we think we become. And so if we're thinking, mm -hmm. like you said before, I'm no good, I'm what in my life, stuff like this, yeah. it's terrible, yeah. got, and then we just keep regurgitating that thought pattern. And, and we, cre we keep creating that reality. It's like every yeah. thought, collapses the Schrodinger equation, is changing waves into particles that are then reassembled into whatever reality you're thinking about. And and so uh, Eric keeps telling us, be wary of your thoughts. Be careful. And he also says we are an em emotional beings, and we need to feel first, think second, and then um, make you know our choices based on that. Instead, we usually think a thought and it, we, it, that evokes an emotional response. And then that emotion creates a sometimes not so good choice. So, uh, so you, you just, you, you seem like that you are saying so many of the things that my son has taught me anyway, uh, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Eric, do you want to chime in and talk about Tom? Yeah, Eric? You He's been he's been um kind of giving me a, a few bits and pieces here and and um keep your language you, sorry Tom but he's there. a cursor he's a little bit of a cursor <laughs> he's gonna rein it in for you I'm sure oh good <laughs> <laughs> he um he just he says Tom that your your mission is so powerful and important mm -hmm. and it really yeah. is um it, it's it's a change and it's a change that. Um, we are experiencing as uh, globally, um, individually, and something that he was bringing forward to me while you were talking, he was pointing out a few things to me, and, and I'll just I'll kind of explain a little bit of this to you, but meditation for me was something that um, it, I came across it after having addiction, um, a great deal of anxiety, and I was diagnosed with cancer. And meditation was, it was the ultimate surrender for me. I didn't understand it. I didn't know really why I was doing it other than I needed something to relieve myself from the, the ultimate pain and suffering that I had. And mm. when I first started to meditate, it was within, I would say, the, the week. And I dedicated myself to 10 minutes, morning and night. And it just felt good to sit. It just felt good to sit without thinking or the need to think of something specific, just to sit in that energy and have the purpose of releasing. And what ended up happening was, and I talk about this a lot because it was an amazing experience, but words popped up in front of me and the word surrender popped up in front of me. And at the moment, I didn't understand in that moment what, what exactly it meant, and it took several years later to really understand what the depth of that was. But meditation, and Eric had taught me this, has turned into my medication. Mm. And without meditation, I was I was terrified being diagnosed with cancer and having a addiction to opiates, mm -hmm. how I was going to get through all the surgeries without painkillers. How was I going to, how was I going to function in the world again? I didn't even know who I was. I didn't know how to operate in the world again. And so it's such a powerful, powerful tool. And I think the the one thing that absolutely astonishes me, and maybe you could talk about this too, it, it is why, I guess, why it, it just seems like such a secret in some ways, but yet it's not but it's just this absolutely amazing tool that's built within us that it doesn't matter where we are. We can be in the car. We can, you know, we can be sitting at home. We could be walking outside, but it's this natural, beautiful tool that relieves our anxieties, our stressors, and really helps 
give us, um, and, and Eric Stig, maybe you could talk about this too, it, it has so many benefits in our life, in our waking life by this commitment to this. You know, I yeah. felt exactly like you did when, when um, I discovered meditation. You know, just a bit mm. of background for everyone. I was a broker mm. on a massive trading room floor. If anyone's seen Wolf of Wall Street, that was my lifestyle. Mm. And I was very much experiencing some side effects of that, which was a lot of anxiety, depression, panic attacks, oh, insomnia. Yeah. And to the point where I went into a very deep, dark spiral of a nervous breakdown and mm. uh, the doctors mm. wanted to medicate me and put me um, on medications and sent me to psychiatrists and psychologists but um, I was it was like a divine intervention I came across meditation and started to explore that and realized and very quickly all of that anxiety the depression insomnia went away very quickly and I realized that there was something very very powerful in this and I couldn't believe that this simple yeah. technique was changing my life so much and that no one really knew about it. This was in 1996. So there was no apps and it wasn't talked about. There was no, you know, blog talk radio, uh, com. There was not even internet back then. So, um, it was very, very new to the West, uh, even in 1996. And so we'd had the Rolling Stones and Mir Farrow and the, you know, the Beatles and, um, exploring Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and the transcendental meditation, but in the seventies and eighties, but it didn't really start to emerge until just in the last few years. But the reason being is that um, this is a very, very new phenomenon over 10,000 years of it being around on the planet where it has traversed and made the leap across from the ashrams and monasteries and the Himalayas and the mountains mm-hmm. of China and Tibet and the monasteries of, um, you know, the Italian and Spanish Alps where Christian monks and all sorts of different types of monks in silence and stillness it suddenly emerged into the mainstream so we're seeing this very tip of the iceberg of it becoming recognized as a very scientifically validated and um, influential tool to make a huge difference in our overall well-being and just to finish on this um, Dr. Bruce Lipson from Stanford University Medical School said that 95 percent yeah he's an amazing man and he said that 95 percent of all sickness we can attribute to stress. So if we want to remove Mm. 95% of sickness on the planet, we just have to look at the cause of stress and and reducing stress. And meditation definitely was changing, a game changer in my life. Biology of belief, man. The biology of Mm. belief. You can talk Mm -hmm. your way, think your way into getting cancer. Uh, Mm. You know, especially when you have self-loathing thoughts uh, as well. So, you know, it's, but I love Bruce. He is awesome. Okay. So and, um, yeah, Eric was also just saying, Tom, that, that we're also coming into a movement in mainstream and, and we've already seen some of this, but he's just saying like meditation in schools, meditation in, in what we would consider our institutions, like work, people taking breaks. And doing group meditations, uh, making this more of a, a necessary part of our daily, like just like our lunch breaks and a coffee break. It's a meditation break, providing meditation spaces, all of those things. And he says that's where we're moving more into, which is so much healthier for all of us. Are, are, there, are the, just before this, sorry, are you the go. corporations that... that that uh, encourage meditation um, amongst the employees? I seem like I heard of yeah, that. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm currently working with Amazon, which is wonderful. I'm, uh, every month we have meditation sessions where I'm, I'm teaching a part of the Amazon staff and we hope oh to go God. a lot wider awesome. across Amazon. Um, yeah, I've just, just, before this call, I just signed a contract with uh, another hotel group called The Core where I'll be running some meditation programs. And we're really starting to see, as you said, as Eric said, very wisely that it starts with the individual then as those individuals start to experience the the change and the shift and those individuals work at certain places and they want to bring it into their work or they want to maybe inspire other work environments or schools or universities to start embracing it so that's when it starts to spread into those institutions environments associations and communities so it's it's the second sort of wave that happens after the individual start that's awesome. And I think it'd be nice. I mean, my dream, and I'm still trying to save money for it, is to create a, a spiritual online school 
for children and, and that will teach all sorts of things like even energy healing, et cetera, just everything mm-hmm. spiritual, but mainly, uh, you know, meditation so they can learn mm-hmm. how to go inward and like you say, discover their inner world, their inner bliss. Yeah, you um, can look so up, um, if, you, if, you, if you Google Gurukul, that's G-U-R-U-K-U-L, G-U-R-U-K-U-L. And in India, these are Gurukuls, which are schools, uh, spiritual schools, and they teach the children phenomenal things from meditation to being able to use almost superhuman capabilities. So big things that they teach the children is how to read with consciousness. So they blindfold the kids and those kids, I've actually oh seen my them perform. Oh, gosh. Are you kidding? Yes, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, and they're starting to, they're doing yeah, it in, in here, even in Sydney now, they've got some some training areas for children. They teach it to adults as well, but adults are a lot more set in their ways and a bit harder to, to access that, that yeah. capability. Um, yeah. But, you know, even Michelle's capability, you know, with Eric. So we, we have these capabilities. So it's just that we're, we're mm. only just scratching the surface of being able to tap into it. Mm-hmm. And the chil- and the children too, like with meditation, when a, a a child, and I would say, you know, when we're looking at, um, you know, um, Buddhism and and the monks that started to meditate when they were young, you know, they're they're very young and open, and they would really reach those stages of it within themselves because that's something that they always did, you know, it's something that they learned. So when we look at um, like myself and and those of us that have caught on to the career in life, it it it's a little different, you know. But we teach this to our children. Children are so open, and it's so much easier for them to be able to learn to pick up these amazing habits and and open up what's naturally within them. Yeah, they're a lot more flexible, aren't they? A lot more adaptable. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, um, is it okay if I'm, I'm going to come back to Tom, of course, too? But there are two people I really need to talk to on on the phone that need uh, Eric's help, and of course, other he, you know uh, callers on the phone. But I, before we close, which is you know 22 minutes from now, I I want to make sure I get these two people on because I'm very concerned about them. Is that okay, Eric? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, he's ready. Awesome. All right. First one is 209 area code. Hi there. Is this me? Yes. Hi. Hello. Eva. Hi. Yes. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Thank you so I'm much fine. for taking Eva, my call. What, sure. I, I know we've been talking for a while and I'm, you know, my, yeah. I'm holding the part of my hand. Uh, the floor is yours. What would you like to ask Eric, sweetie? Um, first of all, well, my, my son is 31 years old and he's been uh, diagnosed with alcohol, hepatitis and acute Mm -hmm. cirrhosis. He's only 31. So my question is, will he be needing a transplant? And if so, will I be able to be a match for him? What's your son's name? Robert. Robert. Oh, and I'm Eva from California. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. No problem. And Eric's saying is have they told him that it's not um that it's not reversible or that it's Yes. Like have they said Two anything they have said that to them? Yes. Well acute cirrhosis there's no um, two out of three doctors that have told them, you know. Yeah. The inflammation. Saying, two out of three are saying. Yeah. But, but I'm sorry? scarring cannot be reversed. Scarring cannot be reversed. No. Inflammation can. Yeah. So at, I'm not sure. Two out of three doctors have said, you know, start making plans for a transplant. And only one has said no. But um, he's in the hospital now. He, they flew it that they took out had an infection in it and then they found out that the infection in, in his blood so oh. I'm so having Eric, a really hard time seeing my yeah Eric well you can I, I can, it, what I can pick up on is a lot of fear and Eric is sure and, and rightfully so um I'm not yeah. that that you're a match or that it's that you're <laughs> going to be the one to be able to help him 
Um, okay. But what Eric is saying is say discipline to finding a match because he says there's fear right now that it's tightened the energy around it. And it's yeah. very easy for us to say, you know, we can say, okay, you know, loosen up on the fear because that's going to make things much easier. But the thing is, is that for there to be a chance for him to go through this is necessary for him to go through this, as hard as that is. But he says he so does have to go through this, and he future. says so a, a trans yeah. is very possible yeah. for him, but he's he's saying no to it being you. Damn it. Okay. And um, one more question. Would Scalar work uh, help with any of this? Eric says that we'll always know. Well, okay. for, for what? For any... the alcoholism? Does he still drink? No, he doesn't. He That's oh, the good. fear. Oh, okay, good, good, good. Okay, well, I will do whatever, babe. I will do whatever. Okay. So, we'll, be, yeah. we'll be praying for him. Give Thank him you so much, Lisa and him. Michelle. You don't need much uh, you, to give your whole liver. You know, it's like the kidneys. Living donors are super... Vital for people like him. Well, that's that's why I was hoping I could be a donor because I'm ready. You know, sh- take it all. I don't care. Yeah. But I know it's oh know, my fifty percent or sixty percent. He's Just strong. He's a, Robert Strong. Strong. Good. Oh good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. Love you all. all right. We'll keep, we'll we'll keep in touch, touch Karen. We'll keep in touch. Eva. Thank you. Oh, it's a you know it's a mother son thing. I I get it. Oh gosh. I, I. Absolutely. All right, so one more, and you guys, if you have any questions for Tom, of course, bring them up. But we have somebody from the nine two zero area code. Oopsie. Let me do that again. I hit. I didn't hit right. Hey there, nine two zero area code. How you doing? Good. This is Michelle. Hey, Michelle. I know you, what you're asking about, but go for it, girl. Yeah, well, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to ask. It's more what do I do. Um, I had some scalar energy done, and uh, it was for weight optimization and um, what was the other one, the enhancement, the tune-up. And um, I haven't seen anything positive, and I had lost 30 pounds last year, and I gained it all back. So I'm – kind of going in a negative direction and I just don't know what to do. It's kind of um, yeah, and it's really weird my whole life, basically. <laughs> because, you know, you and one other person are the only two that, especially after the tune-up one with those seven extra things, has not had positive results. It's very rare. I mean, you watch the YouTubes, the reviews, you know, are just amazing. Sure. So, Eric, what is going freaking on? Um, he says there's a, um, some energy he's showing me that um, some of it's within your heart chakra and down into the sacral area. And he's saying that it's connected to loss, um, like emotional, okay. emotional yes. loss and that death as well. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, so if, if you can get in touch and just do a little bit of work with the emotions, for myself, I know Veronica, Courtney, Denise, any one of us can help you with that. Um, okay. But if you know, because I mean, you don't have to have one of us do it, Eric, because you do know what it is, and it's going in and looking a little deeper with that because it's releasing energy. And interestingly enough, he's saying uh, meditation for you would be very good. So watch the would be Yes. Oh, yes. okay. You're yeah, I will. The perfect show. The perfect show because he's that commitment because it's starting to change patterns because there's some patterns and what we're talking about with the with the energy and we're talking about with the loss is that pattern that's underneath that's kind of holding that root but having a oh. meditation practice and moving moving that energy and starting to change things it's going to make a difference in your day to day functioning because he says there's some Pieces that you're not recognizing right now because there's things going on. And that will make your energy healing go skyrocketing because this piece right here is longer having that layer, that layer of weight 
it's no longer needed. So we have to get to the root of why that's there in the first place. Right. Um, would Qigong be a good thing to practice? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. I did start that. I did start that yeah. last week. So yeah. I'll just continue yeah. with it, that. So keep it keep it disciplined. Keep doing it. He also says to journal and journal your emotions, especially things that, that he says you're very intuitive. And if you start asking yourself questions, start going in and he says, wait for the answers. Ask questions to yourself. Take the pause to listen for the answers. and Start journaling about it because you're going to get to the root of things. You're going to see things okay. in a little different light. And the release of that is a very big difference for you. Okay. Okay, so let me ask you one question. So she, she does all this, goes to you, Veronica, <laughs> whoever, does the journaling and all that. Um, I, I personally feel like when she's finished with that, I – think I'd like to do, of course, for free, the tune-up again. I mean, let the energy all settle, and then I'd like to do that again for her and the rest of her family. Would that help? Eric says, says, yeah, you could, but he also says that, like, the work's already been done, too, so he says it's like a bathtub plug, and so when there's a little piece that's plugged, she starts to move that piece, that energy's still there. So, so you could, totally make you that could. totally makes sense. I totally understand yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Yeah. So that's, Thank that's you, Michelle. Perspective to look on, and I'm I really appreciate it. Thank you yeah. so much. All right. Thanks, Michelle. And I'll contact you, Michelle. Thank you. Okay. Sounds good. There are two Michelles. Um, <laughs> okay. So back to Tom. Sorry, Tom. I I, I I'm really sorry. Yeah, These two I've been worried about, so I just yeah, not a problem at all. It's been beautiful to sit through and listen to it all. So, what else would you like to share with us about this amazing and I think humanity changing documentary? Well, I checked it out today. I watched it today. It was great. Oh, thank you. It's, it's, look, it's a very different style of filmmaking. There's a film and a book. The book's like an extension of the film, so you can get the book or the film or both. Oh. Um, and the film, is it's not a usual, so it doesn't really resonate with, I don't want to build up everyone's expectations here because it's an, it's an unusually styled film and it's not a traditional documentary style film. It's kind of like a, a sort of weaving web that you move in and out of, so it doesn't have that usual trajectory yeah. that we go on. So it's all about, it's about really letting go of the thinking mind and just really surrendering yeah. to it. As, as one person said, I kind of liked how you threw me around a lot and I just had to surrender to it. And that's really what we want the film to be is like an experience yeah. of, that is life. You know, we're moving from scene to scene, moment to moment, person to person, job to job. And so it's this collage of moments that are put together. And a lot of times life isn't really linear. And so we make our, our films linear and our books linear and, and that kind of it's easy to, to, to follow to some respects, but what we did here was it, it's, it's got a little bit of more diversity in that and it's quite an unusual experience. And it's really to get us into feeling into our heart and to open us up into our heart. And, mm. um, and hopefully as you go along the journey, we'll kind of take you from stress to calm throughout the film. And we, towards the end of the film, we have a sort of little meditation and some binaural beats to calm people down. And the book is a um, is a is a bigger sort of journey because we go deeper into people's stories. So that's really the the nature of the it's film well to done. get people out of their heads. It's, it's very well done. It's very well done. I really enjoyed Thanks. it today. It's very well done. Yeah. I recommend this to everybody to check out and um, and to also yeah. all, all of Tom's stuff because Tom, you've got a ton of stuff on your website and information. Um, and and meditation as well. But it, one question I have for you that I think would help, I get a lot of people that come to me and say, you know, don't talk to me about meditation or even meditation to me. I can't do it. I can't get my mind to, to still. Um, what would you say to somebody? And I'm sure you've had people say this. Yeah, say it's to the main somebody, thing that people bring up. Yeah. I mean, look, yeah. I, I was the same. I, I had no interest in meditation. Yeah. I didn't think I could do it. And a lot of it's because mm-hmm. we're trying techniques designed for people in this particular lifestyle. A lot of the techniques people are trying to use are techniques that people used in monasteries, but they didn't have emails, they didn't have phones, didn't have 
family and, and financial problems. And so they didn't have those mm-hmm. distractions. So when we try to integrate those types of meditations into this type of lifestyle, it's, it, it gets a little bit more challenging. So the technique that I suggest and use is one where we, we use a tool called a mantra, and that's a sound that you repeat over and over again. Mm. And two things about mm. those sounds is that firstly, they make the process a lot easier because you don't have to try to not think, you just have to repeat the sound. So we're replacing one thought with another thought really, which is just the repetition of a sound as opposed to trying to not have a thought, which is very, very difficult for the mind. Oh gosh, yes, yes. So we we make it a lot easier. And secondly, we recognize that there's, there's no problem with having thoughts during meditation, particularly with this style of meditation, because having thoughts in meditation can actually indicate that you're actually meditating quite well. It just means that you're clearing stress. And that's the way we teach it is that that stress clearing in the body can activate a busy mind during the meditation, which is quite the opposite of what people would think meditation is. But it's actually what does happen during meditation when we start clearing stresses out. Well, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, I I can't wait. I'm going to watch it right after the show. And I didn't know there was a book too. Now, Tom, you did you get in connection with Paula, the the lady that's the, the filmmaker, producer, yeah. director that's got to do the Channeling Eric uh, documentary? She she did the Teal Swan um, Open Shadow documentary, which is amazing. So, do you guys know each other? We've been chatting on email since uh, we got we got connected. Yeah, so it's been wonderful to connect in with each other. She's amazing. She really yeah. is. And yeah. it's wonderful to yeah, see like all this conscious lot. filmmaking coming out now. You know, it's wonderful yes. people using film as a medium to put something out, else out other than people getting shot up or broken marriages. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. Oh. All right. Um, That's amazing. Do you want to say something else or would you want me to take another call from a caller? Eric, um, you, you guys have the floor. I mean, is that, is that for Eric or is that for me? Well, well uh, I've, both of you guys. What, or Michelle, um, tell me what you want. Well, I I just was going to say that um, it, Eric Eric was kind of piping up too, and and I think that um, Eric may have had a hand in bringing Tom this direction as well, because yeah. um, Eric Eric is just pointing out Tom as being like on the leading edge of change. Mm. being a change maker and um, that's very much up Eric's alley as well and we know that Eric Paula to us too so it's really amazing to see all of these different ways that we are bringing the world together and that we're bringing changers and bringing out this information and it's it's pretty neat to see Eric kind of on the head of that of transformation well it's It's wonderful to know Eric's in, on this in this part of this journey as well, and I, I guess I probably want to hear from Eric because I, I find it quite challenging at times. Is sometimes when I'm like, um, I just want to withdraw from being in that front line of change. It's and, and in all transparency, you know, it's it's sometimes I wonder, well, what would it be like oh, just um, to work in a Walmart and stack shelves and just be an anonymous yeah, person? <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Yes, I've been there, done that. Yeah. Sometimes I just want to be a little hermit. It's just, you mm-hmm. know, yeah. He says, you know, Tommy says, and that's that's pretty natural. And he says it's interesting because a lot of us that are in positions that we are we are doing some forms of leadership, we do have this side to us that is very much uh, wanting to recluse and wanting mm. to kind of be honest and go inside. And he says that's very natural. And I know I'm like that. You know, and, yeah. and sometimes people will find it very surprising because they're like, Michelle, you're so outgoing, and I love to speak, and I love to teach and, and lead and whatnot, but I really do like being that wallflower. I love to observe oh, and kind me, of be to myself. I, but maybe it's, maybe maybe it's the people like us who are light workers or we tend to have been through – enough stuff that the, we become more humble. I mean, raising five kids for me was a very humbling experience. So <laughs> we have this, this sense of humility that makes us feel reclusive. Um, yeah. Maybe. Eric, what do well, you think? Eric says, 
he says that it's also that, you know, um, doing this type of work when you are um, connecting with large groups of people, many different types of emotions and diversities, and um, oh. we need that time to recharge. Hmm. We're, yeah. we're built this way. To be able to go out, to put our efforts out, to teach, to people and then we need to be able to come back and recharge that's kind of the way um the way that most of us have always been but we've always been in like you know the industries that i was for and i sold used cars and i did all of these different things but it, it was i would always need to come back and recharge and i'm yeah. sure tom with the you know the finance for the amount of years that you were like that must have been incredibly difficult for you to keep that momentum going, like why all that stress and everything oh my God. built up, which would be just a, a crazy industry to be in. Yeah, my yeah, husband exactly. worked uh, for B. Riley. Uh, he's a wealth management, you know, advisor. He loves it. He loves it. But I think, you know, part of it is because he channels a lot of information. I think he's psychic. Now, I want to mm-hmm. ask this, Eric. Tom, is some of the, this documentary – channeled is does he channel some of this well maybe tom you already know i don't know um do you already do this because eric says that you you do bring in divine inspiration yeah i feel some of the things you say are so profound they almost sound like they've got a divine nature yeah look i mean i definitely feel that um as I almost clear myself out of the way, it allows something to, mm-hmm. to almost speak through me. But it's not like, um, you know, some ascended being is I'm channeling. It just feels like it's less like I kind of almost allow an open conduit to sort of flow, and then right. what needs to come through, it just comes through. But I can't right. really place it or put a name on it or anything like that. Right. It's divine. It's divine intelligence, he says. Mm. Oh wow! Yeah. Divine. Which I think that's we all have access to. You know, I, I, I think me. it's just that I right. spent many years quietening me out of the the vestibule, so that whatever right. to come through will come through. We all. I think we. I'm not trying to. I want no. everyone to understand. It's not like I'm special because I was just a dumbass broker for 26 years of my life. It just so happens that I spent a lot of time <laughs> meditating and clearing yeah. that space, so that that. That what's wanting to come through, all of us can come through. Yes, and, and that's and that's the exact truth. That that is the 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 message is that every single one of us, this is how we are, this is our nature, and that we all have to do this. We all mm-hmm. have the ability to, you know, connect to the the inner world of ourselves and to bring out whatever that is within us. Yeah, but to really be the very best us the very best individual, the very best in the world that we can be for ourselves. And that's really what this is all about, is bringing mm-hmm. out the very best in us, to live yeah. a life of peace. Yeah. And, and that's an, yeah. another way that, uh, another benefit of meditation, moving yourself out of the way so you yeah. can get the divine inspiration. There's so many benefits. Lowering blood mm-hmm. pressure, all sorts of things. Uh-oh. 60 seconds. I better close up here. Tom Cronin, thank you so much. It's been an honor. You guys, we're going to have the link that you can click on to uh, watch the, the this amazing documentary and, of course, the book. Paola will put in the, the um, link for the book. And, of course, you guys know that and if anything other information you uh, want in the description box, Tom, just let Paola know and she will put it there. And, of course, Michelle, Michelle, the healing art.com. Thank you guys for such a great time and love you, Eric. I love you so much. We love you, Mom. Mm. Thanks, Tom. Thanks bye, for everyone. It's been wonderful chatting with you all. Thank you so much, so much for your time. Bye, everyone. You too. All right. Thank, thank you. Care.